This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. This week we are talking about perhaps the most contentious issue in politics today, namely nationalism, along with a couple of its corollary issues of self-determination and immigration. Mises wrote quite a bit about all of this, and our own Dr. Joe Salerno summarized Mises' view a couple of years ago in really a seminal paper called Mises on Nationalism, the Right of Self-Determination, and the Problems of Immigration. Now, Joe is going to reprise this paper at the upcoming Students for Liberty conference happening in Washington, D.C., just one week from today. So we thought you'd enjoy a conversation about Mises and his view on nationalism between myself and Dr. Salerno that we taped a year or so ago. So stay tuned. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking today with none other than Dr. Joe Salerno, our VP for Academic Affairs. And Joe has written an article just about a week ago entitled Mises on Nationalism, the Right of Self-Determination, the Problem of Immigration. It's really a sweeping article, Joe. I think it brings up a lot of the uh, points of debate that are current not only in Austrian circles, but in libertarian circles and and, and really uh, in uh, greater political circles now in the U.S. and in the West as well. So I think uh, it's worthy of discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll post a link to it as well as, I think, a link to uh, Guido Holzman's biography of Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, because there are some sections in that book that I think really pertain to what Mises was thinking and how he developed his thought on this. Uh, but Joe, what I like so much about this article is that you, you're, you're willing to tackle some of these problems from Mises' perspective, uh, the idea of subsidiarity versus universalism, uh, the, the notion of free migration and immigration versus self-determination, uh, and there's a lot of tensions inherent in these, and I think a lot of the rhetoric out there on on open borders and immigration and nationalism is facile. It doesn't necessarily take in all the points uh, that we ought to be considering. But let me let me start with this. Mises, is, of course, born in the late 1800s in, the, in what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire and what is now where, where he was born, now part of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, this is a guy who saw a lot of different languages, a lot of different nationalities, a lot of different eth- ethnicities, all sort of uh, subjugated by monarchs. And so h- how does his, his experience of growing up in a polyglot uh, region of the world be, prior to World War I, h- how do you think that factors into to his entire worldview on, on nationalism and, and migration? I think it profoundly affected his worldview on, nationaliz- uh, on nationalism and on, on uh, immigration. Uh, you know, being in the Austro-Hungarian Empire with a, a multitude of, of nationalities, uh, different languages, traditions, and so on, uh, he he saw that when when uh, political power was exercised by by a majority in a certain area, that it inevitably uh, resulted in um, a, a, let's say a situation and, and and an interpretation of the laws, if not the laws themselves, that were oppressive to the minority, and they were oppressive. Uh, both intentionally and and and, and unintentionally, uh, people naturally thought that their um, culture and the and 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 their way of thinking, their ideology, their Weltanschauung, their worldview, uh, should be spread and and imposed on on the minority. Well, you talk about Mises in this article as a cosmopolitan, and that that's not necessarily, certainly not in Mises' view. Um, at odds with nationalism per se. I, I mean, first, give us give us sort of your thumbnail definition of cosmopolitanism, as, as Mises would have understood the term. As Mises understood the term, it was uh, a situation where pe- peoples, different peoples and different nationalities, lived peacefully with one another and, and interacted through through trade, free trade, and uh, had no animus, uh, had no reason to want to extend their political political control over other nationalities and peoples. And when we talk about nationalities, I mean, that's a word that's very nebulous. It, it can apply to different linguistic groups, which it, it certainly does, but also to people of, of similar linguistic groups, maybe of different religions or, or people who had uh, lived in, on different sides of the mountain and, and, and had different experiences that caused them to have different cultural affinities and so on. But I think a lot of times today the term is used as a denigration towards provincial uh, nationalists or people who want to cling to tradition or cling to, uh, you know, their their own culture, as opposed to people who are more worldly and and better traveled and who who basically want uh, multiculturalism as a as a universal value. Yeah, well, you, you can think today of, of of think of the Amish uh, in parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio. 
Uh, they might be provincial in some sense. They're, they're, they're bound very closely together by customs, traditions, and religion. But yet, they're very cosmopolitan. It, 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 uh, if you visit, they're, they're very welcoming. Uh, and, you, you, you know, they, they, they buy and sell. Uh, they allow you, they um, actually have uh, um, bed and breakfast that, that you can stay in. But on the other hand, they, they look at the rest of the world as, as different from themselves, and that, and as their culture as being something that's, to them, superior to to, to other cultures. Now, at the outset of the article, you talk about uh, Mises' definition of liberalism, or how he would have thought yes. of it. You sort of provide a two pronged uh, analysis for that, uh, but you also talk about classical liberalism, which David Gordon argues is kind of a made up yes, expression in the twentieth yes. century because progressives came along and stole the term right. liberalism somewhere, probably around the Great Wars when that shifted. Um, but let's talk about your or, or Mises' definition yes. of liberalism as having two problems, one being freedom and self-determination, but also the nationality principle, which you, you take pains to point out is not statist right. in nature, but uh, a, a, I think a lot of libertarians uh, view nationalism as inherently um, statist, statist and, yeah. and illibertarian. And, and as you point out, digging a little deeper, Mises did not necessarily agree. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so Mises saw liberalism uh, as composed of two principles, one of which was sort of freedom and laissez-faire in uh, domestic policy, and the other of which was what, what he called the nationality principle. Now, by that, what he meant was that when people are free to um, form their own political um, or uh, units that that they tend to form them in a way that results in people of the same nationality, the same language, living together uh, under uh, uh, the same set of laws. Uh, so, uh, what he, what he was at pains to um, point out was that people did not uh, that that this nationality principle was not the cause of of different nations, but really the, the result of the, it was the result of, of people's uh, self-determination. So the principle of self-determination um, resulted in people who self-identify with certain cultures and languages forming a, a political unit. So liberalism itself um, the, uh, appeared on the scene uh, as sort of a revolutionary movement against these foreign rulers uh, that were imposing, um, you know, that were despotic and and, 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 and oppressive. And so, as an, Mises looked on, on, on nationalities getting together in a political unit, Germans, Italians, Serbs, as an alliance of the oppressed against the, uh, the foreign oppressor. That's the way he right. phrased it. Right. And also his experience in World War One, he was obviously someone who was a, an Austrian patriot vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the Russians. Absolutely, um, and and fought personally against the Russians in in World War One. Um, that I get the sense that Mises is using the term nationalism in a way that that people used it before World War Two. I think Hitler uh, and and the Nazis really changed in people's minds what nationalism is. Um, but maybe maybe the term's gotten a bad rap. And I want to give you a quote from your article. He says. Um, Mises contends that nationalism is thus a, nat a natural outcome of and in complete harmony with individual rights. And I, I think a lot of people would not see nationalism that way today. No. In fact, um, Mises does distinguish between sort of ag aggressive nationalism and peaceful or liberal nationalism. He uses those terms over and over again, or sometimes militant nationalism as being also aggressive nationalism. And so from Mises' point of view, peaceful nationalism was just a nationalism that was a natural nationalism that arose from these two principles of laissez-faire and uh, uh, the nationality principle that is based on the right of self-determination. Uh, when you had polyglot territories, that is, different um, languages, people who spoke different languages, living under the same state as we did before and after World War I, um, that's when militant nationalism got its start. And that's how you know, Hitler got his start, that he wanted to bring all the Germans, uh, the, the, Ger the German nation, in, uh, under the control of the German state. Uh, so that was aggressive nationalism. And he wanted su to subject other peoples in those areas where Germans lived to the, uh, to, 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 uh, the, um, the despotism of, 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 his, of his state. Well, I think we have to consider also not only did did Mises grow up in the in the old patchwork of of, of the Austro-Hungarian yeah. Empire, but he also lived in a time before mass media created much more of a monoculture in the West that there were really differences 
among peoples and territories and languages. Now today, this always gets uncomfortably mixed in with race. And I think that's that's sort of the bed bug in this whole uh, conversation about nationalism yes. and immigration. Uh, but when you when you you move on in the article to talk about Mises's views on colonialism, I was talking to you offline about how the, you, yeah. you, know, you could read something like this in the Nation or or, or hear it on NPR. I mean, how 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 uh, the degree to which he hated European colonialism and and thought that it would it would yield. Very bad things, which it did and, and continues yes. to do. But there's, a, there's a, uh, a quote here from Mises, not from you, that's particularly striking today. Europeans must not be surprised if the bad example that they themselves have set in their colonies now bears evil fruit. So it, it almost strikes me as a parallel, the colonialism of the 1800s and early 1900s versus the interventionism today of, of Western countries in the Middle East. Yeah, well, I mean, the earlier the earlier colonialism, Mises was was fighting against hypocrisy that said, well, even if 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 we 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 should leave them alone, they're not fit yet to govern themselves. And Mises, said, of course, they're not fit to govern themselves at this point because they followed your example. Um, you know, the, the suppression of 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 the indigenous peoples. Uh, what was was the, the main point of of colonialism? Their enslavement and their expropriation. Well. You know, Mises, of course, was a Democrat. Yeah. Um, but I think he he saw democracy differently. He didn't he didn't see it as a mass multicultural democracy, and and I think that that's evidenced by your treatment of 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 his jaundiced eye towards majoritarianism, majority rule, and that for for minority populations within a a, 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 a political area, right. um, their life was was much like. Uh, those in the colonies. In other words, if you're a minority in a democratic uh, uh, political apparatus, you're sort of colonized. Yeah, I mean, he, he made that point very strongly. He says, who cares if um, it's a result of foreign conquest or of, of a majority um, that, that you're living under certain rules and laws that you had no really no part because you don't speak the same language, no part in, in helping to formulate. Uh, even though you might have representatives, minority representatives in, in in the legislature, they really there is no chance that that their thoughts are going to be heard and acted on. Well, and he and he talks about the the uh, natural antipathies that may or may not exist between right. people, and and I think you see this even in the U.S. today. Look at the antipathies produced by democracy. The people who hate Trump's guts, right. Uh, right now feel that they've lost their right of self-determination. I mean, this is what a vast social democratic uh, majority, majority welfare state looks like, right? I mean, right. if you, That's right. if you uh, hate Trump, I guess you feel put upon right now. You feel oppressed. You feel dis disenfranchised, right? That, that, but but um, I, uh, what Mises would say to all that is, of course, you have the chance of being the majority again, mm -hmm. whereas someone of a different nation, nation in the in the in, the, in Mises's sense uh, of a, a people who self-identify with a certain religion, language, and so on, there they oh, they will they have no chance. Right. There's no right. prospect of ever right. becoming a majority. Right, like Hillary might win in four years, right? But the, but the Cherokee Nation is never going to get its president in the United States. Right. Exactly. And, and, and the other thing I note is that open borders libertarians, I, I never hear them say that Cherokee nationalism is a bad thing. Uh, and, and there That's was, a good point. in other words, I think, I think most of our listeners would say a, a real Cherokee nation ought to be completely independent of the U.S. federal government. It ought to uh, not pay taxes, not follow federal regulations. It ought to be sovereign territory, even if it exists within the, the uh, borders and confines physically of the current United States. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, and I think uh, you know the um, the U.S. government has co-opted th th these um, nations. Who initially these the Indian nations would probably have wanted to be completely free of the of, of the U.S. But uh, now they're tied into the, the state governments. They have casinos. They they've been co-opted, so they're no longer a separate nation. They no, no longer have a yearning uh, to to exercise the right of self determination. Unfortunately, because of the welfare state. Well, th then you delve into this thorny problem of uh, physical movement of people, migration of people versus self-determination. And, and, and you identify, as Mises did, the tensions here. Um, and one point that Mises makes I'd like you to touch on is that, that when states are illiberal – 
the the nationality principle that uh, that he saw as part of liberalism becomes more important be, because the state is is uh, providing welfare the state is is uh, is controlling life through regulation maybe through socialist ownership um so the idea of uh, of a nation within the state um becomes exacerbated or heightened yes it does the, the national conf the nationality conflicts become heightened because the larger the state is, the more margins on which it makes decisions that um, impinge on, on, on the rights uh, of, of the minority populations. So uh, interventionism exacerbates any natural antipathies that may exist. But they, they really don't even go national, – nationality conflicts actually still even exist under a laissez-faire liberal um, – uh, democracy uh, in which there is no uh, right of self-determination in, in which people cannot opt out uh, language uh, you know, linguistic groups and so on so Mises goes beyond saying that if we just get rid of the interventionist state and we have a minimal state laissez-faire state things would be fine he says, he says well well things certainly are worse under socialism or interventionism for the minority nationality but but they're not fine under laissez-faire liberalism in fact we've not completed the liberal revolution yet. We have to allow the exercise of, of the, the right of self-determination of peoples uh, and allow them to opt out because even where they're just administering the courts uh, and, uh, uh, and, and contracts and so on, there, there's, there's ways of, of, of the majority imposing on and oppressing the minority. So this, this calls into question where they have, even if we had some kind of minimal night watchman state, um, would a multicultural society still be free? Would people still feel that they had self-determination? But of course, at some point, it's, a, it's an impossible problem. I think Mises even says this, that you, you can always get to a smaller and smaller minority down to a minority of one person. Um, and, and it's very hard to, to, to create political subgroups, however small, that really take into account every individual's thoughts right. or interests, right? So we're, we're not talking about utopia here. We're talking no. about we're talking about trying to improve things. You know, one interesting point, uh, just to, 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 uh, on this, Mises makes a, 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 a response to those people who always bring up Switzerland as a counterexample where they're Germans, Italians, and French. And uh, they say, well, look, here's a multicultural state. And he says, well, no, they're separated into cantons. Um, and in fact, he, he, he makes a statement that if indeed there was – um, internal migration, where you had a substantial minority of, let's say, French in, in a German ca canton, then you would have, he said, the, the peace of Switzerland would long ago have vanished. Right, right. Well, what's interesting is, is that um, Mises, really speaking here more as a, as a political theorist yeah. and a, uh, a sociologist, not an economist per se, but he said, you know, we, we can see that there are values above and beyond uh, just greater productivity in the workforce or greater efficiency um, that could argue against mass migration of people across borders. So he was he was willing to acknowledge a cultural component because as libertarians yes. were often viewed as, you know, we'd sell our grandmothers for another point right, of GDP. Right. right, right, but, right. but Mises didn't see things that way. No, he, he didn't. He even said that uh, in, in, in a completely free world where we, you didn't have, let's say, a government intervening in any way. Um, people's cultural affinities, their their um, desire to be near their families and 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 speak and people who speak their language would not equalize wages throughout the world, would not bring about uh, the maximum human productivity. So why should we aim at at that as a policy? Right. Uh, uh, that's what I would call economistic, trying to make policy based on some maximizing something or optimizing something which unfortunately is a characteristic of the Chicago School of Economics, but not the Austrian School. Well, whenever we're talking about Mises on any subject, especially outside of economics, I always like to, to point out to people that he, he's obviously authoritative, someone we should listen to. He's not necessarily just positive or infallible. Right. Um, what, what can we take from all this? In, in other words, in, in libertarian debate these days, there tends to be this idea that you're either open borders or you're some sort of status closed borders person who wants a vast federal apparatus and checkpoints and guys with guns at the border stopping, uh, you know, impoverished Mexicans from entering the United States or, or poor Syrian refugees or whatever. And of course, that, that, those aren't the two choices. In other words, we were arguing for some kind of market borders. And, and we're a long way from a private property society where it really was up to uh, property owners alone. 
I've always found it uh, a bit facile when people say, well, you have no interest in controlling any property other than that, what you, j- what you particularly own in your town. Um, and then Rothbard later in life came to see that the individual uh, and, and the state were not the only two units of analysis uh, yeah. when it comes to this. So, so talk yeah. about how, what you see as yeah. a libertarian position on borders and immigration today. Yeah, I uh, um, I think it's uh, Mises' work is, is extremely important here, sort of overriding importance. Mises um, does not see, uh, does not give a solution to, to, to immigration. He says the best that we can do is, is to allow state borders to be changed as, as peoples and nations move. Um, but but he, he does, doesn't come out and set out any sort of program for that. But what he, he does do is, is, is to show us that immigration is always a political problem. As long as there's a state, there's going to be a problem. No matter how small the units you get, as you pointed out before, there's, there may very well be minorities that are oppressed. So we have to start from that premise. I mean, that, that's a positive insight, meaning that it's, you know, he, he's not making any value judgment. He's saying that nations exist. Um, unfortunately, majorities oppress minorities. So let's start from there and see how, how we can have a peaceful world. So you can, you can re, just reading Mises, you can reject the open border position. I mean, that, you know, they're, giving, they're, they're giving a solution and a very um, radical solution without even knowing really the problems. So I think this is a debate starter, not a de- Mises is not a debate ender, but a debate starter, but it does narrow the debate. It does push out sort of the completely closed border types as well as the open border types. They're, 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 they're people that, that have not examined the problem and have no insight into it at all. So I think we have to start all over again as libertarians to, to think about this. This is a, a, a world of states and of nations, and there are two different things. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in this issue of nationalism and immigration, um, you know, from the open borders perspective, Jacob Hornberger is writing a lot about this. And of course, our own Walter Block yes. is writing yeah. a lot about this. Um, you know, Hoppe has written quite a bit about a, a private property society. And now we've got Salerno uh, channeling Mises and, and writing about this as well. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, again, we will post a link to Joe's article called Mises on Nationalism, the Right of Self-Determination, the Problem of Immigration. Uh, from my perspective, one of the most important articles of the year. Nice. And and I think that it, it's something that we owe it to ourselves to delve into. I think that uh, Trump's election has caused a lot of bad feelings, and a lot of ill will, um, and, and a lot of uh, superficial thinking on the part of, of people on both the left and right. right. And uh, I think um, it, it's time for us to get beyond this. And I really think that the best solution in a, in a, in a failed world is this principle of subsidiarity. And it, and, and it yes. amazes me with Trump in power why the left in particular continues to resist this when we could all get to a place where we're perhaps not self-governed, but uh, governed in, in a manner that's uh, that's more amenable to our worldview. And, and th- that's really uh, um, something that I think we, we as libertarians ought, ought to be to be working towards, which is uh, subsidiarity and, and secession and nullification. Right. And if you're never Trump, um, you, you should be yeah, you applauding should be in favor this. Of this. Of course, yes. Well, Joe Salerno, thanks so much for your time. A, a great article, a fascinating conversation, yeah. and the debate's not going to go away anytime soon. No, you're right. Thank you. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.